So the, the, the cheeky title of my talk here stems from the fact that over the last 100 to 250 years or so, um, there's been an abundance of both scientific and clinical data um, clearly showing the presence of bacteria throughout the urinary tract, um, including in, in the kidneys. But um, one of the most common comments that I get after giving a urobiome talk is, well, you know, I thought the urinary tract was sterile. Um, and so clearly it's not, not the case. So a little bit about uh, the background for um, the urobiome as it relates particularly to the kidneys. Um, so there was a paper recently published by Dr. Wolf's group, this uh, tarnished gold in the standard urine culture. And so it really outlines the, the persistent belief that the urinary tract is in fact sterile. And he shows in there that, that this paradigm is largely based on studies in the mid 1800s when you know, microbiology was really at its infancy and, and the techniques you know, really geared towards cultivation of very easily grown uh, bacteria, um, which as we know today, uh, excludes most bacteria. Um, so in the last decade or so, um, we've really seen a resurgence of the topic of the urobiome, um, and this is really based on newer culture-based and molecular techniques. And really in the last decade, we, we've basically reiterated the, the overwhelming evidence um, that in fact there are viable bacteria um, throughout the urinary tract, um, even in the absence of, of infection. So most of my lab is, is focused on research into kidney stones. And you know, the field of kidney stones also provides a robust clinical data that there are in fact bacteria in the kidneys, um, primarily through the use of kidney stone cultures. And so you know, the, the evidence that there are bacteria in kidney stones goes at least back to 1767 with this manuscript by Morgani et al. Um, showing that there's bacteria or, or infection associated with stones and in kidney tissue. Um, so I, I found this reference for this Morgani paper from a 1958 manuscript, but they didn't provide the full reference. And I, I tried to find it online, but I, I couldn't. So I just have the, the date and the, and the authors. Um, but we show evidence at least back um, that long. So most discussions in uh, kidney bacteria, particularly with kidney stones, centers on um, struvite stones, which are also known as infection stones. And so these are known to be caused by paleonephritis, which is kidney infection. And so uh, kidney infections are often caused by either a vesicoureteral reflex dependent or independent accession of uropathogens like E. coli or, or proteus or other bacteria. Um, but more recent studies also find that there are bacteria, primarily E. coli, in uh, multiple types of non-infection stones. So these are like calcium oxalate, calcium phosphate, or, or other types of stones. Um, and this is in, uh, in patients that have no history of urinary tract infection. So beyond the, the direct evidence that there are bacteria uh, in kidney stones or in the kidney tissue, we also have indirect evidence uh, of bacteria in the kidneys from the kidney stone research. And so um, this is a, a micrograph from Maki et al. in 2020 um, that shows the clear evidence of neutrophils highlighted here in the red. And so for the immunologists in their group, um, you know that neutrophils are one of the frontline uh, defenses for bacterial invasion. And so the presence of these uh, cells in kidney stones um, suggests that there are bacteria that they are fighting. And there was also a very interesting paper published back in 2018 by Siva Guru et al. that used a geobiology approach to look at um, stones. And what they found was clear evidence of active dissolution and recalcification of the calcium oxalate minerals that were in the stones. And so this kind of activity is also widely found in biofilms attached to calcified um, structures throughout nature. And so it really su suggests that there's active bacterial um, metabolism going on in stones. Um, and this group also followed this up with a microbiome analysis of, of the same uh, kidney stones again, showing that there's microbial organisms. So all of this evidence really points towards an obvious hypothesis that there are low levels of bacteria that are resident in the kidneys and can impact physiology at sub-infectious levels. And so when I first came across this hypothesis, um, I looked into the literature a bit and I was actually quite surprised. And so I found this paper, and if you look at the, the date here, it was published in 1925, so almost hundred years ago. And the title of the paper was The Kidney, A Filter for Bacteria. And so even 100 years ago, they, they found evidence that the, uh, the kidney as an organ helps to filter out bacteria that get into um, systemic circulation. 
And they referenced a, a 1982 study that suggested, and they suggested that they also found evidence of this, um, you know, 50 years before that. And, I, and again, I couldn't find this um, direct uh, publication. But in this 1925 study, what they did is they took rabbits and they injected them with several different classes of bacteria. And then they waited for different time intervals, sacked them, collected the kidney tissue, and then looked for evidence of the bacteria. So this is one of the micrographs that they showed. And so I can't, I couldn't really tell from this, you know, from this image, but um, the figure legend says there's nine colonies, eight of which are in the glomeruli, um, 10 minutes after the injection of the organism. And so through this study, they, they found clear evidence that if you inject bacteria into circulation uh, and wait a certain amount of time, they show up in the kidneys and they get cleared into the kidneys through the, uh, into the urine. And so um, this is a, it's an excellent paper and I, I can forward it to the group um, if you're interested, but um, if anything else, what this paper really highlights is not a whole lot has changed in the last hundred years in terms of urobiome research and um, clinical acceptance of you know, urinary tract bacteria. Um, they, they talk about a lot of the same things that we as a group um, talk about. So building up on that last 100 to 250 years, um, we got into looking at um, kidney bacteria. And so first, what we wanted to do um, in order to determine if kidney bacteria actually influence kidney physiology and, and urinary um, diseases, we wanted to see if bacteria were actually there. And so what we did is we took some uh, tissue from kidney biopsies as well as autopsies, and we developed an RNA-based fluorescent institute hybridization probe that targets all bacteria universally. And so what I'm showing here uh, uh, is a glomeruli from one of these biopsies, um, and Circled in white are these bright red um, fluorescent stains. And so these are, are the correct size and shape of uh, bacteria in the glomeruli. And if you squint and you look really hard, it actually looks like these bacteria are replicating in, in, in some of these cases here. If we look into the tubules, we see much more. We see a lot more bacteria, particularly attached to the epithelial layers of the, the tubules. Um, and this is right where we expect um, kidney stones to form. And so one potential criticism is like, oh, if you're looking at autopsy, autopsy tissues, how do you know that bacteria isn't magically appearing and, and you know, taking over the kidneys? And so, like I said, we looked at both um, autopsies and biopsies, and clearly there are um, higher levels of uh, bacteria signals in the autopsy tissues, but it wasn't significant, um, particularly because there was a couple of autopsy tissues that was much lower. And so the important thing is we found bacteria in every, uh, every tissue sample that we looked at. Um, and, and I'll also note that these probes were, were vigorously validated against multiple pure cultures and, and other um, types of, of tissues to ensure that they are in fact um, bacteria specific. So then what we wanted to do is we wanted to get a, a little bit of a better idea on um, if the kidney microbiome influences uh, kidney physiology and kidney disease. And so we looked at two independent cohorts in which both studies, they, they took laser microdissected glomeruli and tubuli, and they subjected the tissue to uh, RNA-seq, and so a transcriptomic approach. And um, past literature shows that RNA-seq data specifically comes from viable bacteria as opposed to residual um, DNA as what you might expect to get from shock and metagenomics. So this, this technique really targets the viable um, bacteria. And so <clears throat> again, 100% of the time we detected microorganisms in these um, in the glomeruli and the tubuli. And I wanted to point out two different things with this particular chart. One on the y-axis, we have the portion of sequence reads that mapped to the microbiome. And so you can see about 0.3% of all the reads were microbiome based. So like the, the abundance of these bacteria is very, very low, but they're there, they're, they exist. Um, the other thing is that there were significant differences between the glomeruli and the tubuli in terms of the number of sequences mapping to um, uh, to the microbiome. If we do some alpha diversity analyses, looking at the, the total number of species detected, so this is RNA-seq. So we looked at um, bacteria, archaea, protists, viruses, and fungi. So this is transdomain. Um, again, we see some significant differences um, between the glomeruli and tubuli. And it's important to point out that um, these were paired samples. So the glomeruli and tubuli come from the same patient. So there's clear differences based on where um, in the nephron we're looking. And so one of the things that we did is we wanted to see why um, there's this difference between the glomeruli and tubuli. 
And so we did some correlations between age and the uh, alpha diversity. And interestingly, what we found was that while there is no correlation with age for tubuli microbiome and alpha diversity, there was a significant increase over time with glomeruli. And so this offers a, a potential mechanism for the infiltration of bacteria into the kidney space. And specifically, as you age, you regularly lose glomeruli. And so if you lose a glomeruli, that, um, that allows for large molecules, so like uh, red blood cells that are four to five times larger than bacteria, um, they can get into the nephrons and get into the urinary space. And so um, what our data is suggesting is that with the loss of glomeruli, you're potentially getting more bacteria or other microorganisms infiltrating into, the, uh, into that empty vacuole where the glomeruli once was, and eventually making its way down into the uh, tubulis as well. So if you do some beta diversity analyses um, against these paired samples, again, you know, they're, they're very clearly um, different, even though the glomeruli and tubuli are coming from the same uh, individuals. And so uh, again, if you don't know, beta diversity looks at the presence and absence of bacteria or other microorganisms, as well as the relative abundance. So the, the kidney microbiome uh, almost always is dominated by the proteobacteria followed by the firmicutes. And we typically find this same uh, phylum level profile throughout the ur urinary tract. Um, sometimes the proteobacteria and the firmicutes are switched in terms of the relative abundance, but this is the most common uh, taxonomic uh, profile that we see. So for those of you that are a little bit more microbiology uh, inclined, you know that the, the proteobacteria contain known neuropathogens like E. coli, proteus, uh, Klebsiella, and, and a few other ones, whereas the firmicutes contains your protective bacteria like your lactococcus and lactobacillus. And so um, to, to look at the, the question of whether this microbiome is impacting uh, renal physiology, we then did some correlations between alpha diversity and two different metrics of renal function. So that's serum creatinine and uh, glomerular filtration rate. So we saw a positive correlation between diversity and creatinine and a negative correlation with uh, between diversity and glomerular filtration rate. So both of these data suggest that as kidney function declines, you see an increase in the, in the um, diversity of, of microorganisms that occur. And so again, um, this suggests that with a lower ability to clear these microbial organisms, they, they tend to build up in the, in the kidney space and, and show up in the nephrons. So to get a little bit more granular on uh, the association of the microbiome and uh, different kidney diseases, um, I have, we looked at multiple different clinical phenotypes. And the, the, the important columns here are in the, the metadata and the two-way. So the, the, we sh I've showed previously that there's clear differences in the glomeruli and the, and the tubules, which is the glom versus TI. But um, the significant differences here, and um, I think this is alpha and beta diversity, um, we show multiple associations, including, like I said, glomerular or the uh, creatinine and uh, EGFR, but also multiple different glomerular diseases, hypertension, um, APL1 genotype, um, as well as HIV, HIV infection and, and chronic kidney disease. And so this really suggests that um, not only is there bacteria there, but they are associated some way with um, kidney disease. Um, whether or not this is a cause or effect, um, we don't know from this data alone. So next, what we wanted to do is see um, what environmental factors might influence um, the type of bacteria that are present. And so we recently published a clinical study looking at explanted stents. stents. And so these stents were explanted for any number of reasons. Sometimes they were explanted for um, infection, um, but most, most of them were explanted for other reasons. And we looked at not only was a biofilm present, um, but what factors influenced biofilm? So I'll, I'll note that um, for those of you that don't know that the stents that were in place, um, there was a portion that was implanted into the kidneys and a portion that was in, implanted into the bladder. And we looked at each of those segments separately. And one of the, the very intriguing things that we have found is that patients that were given antibiotics in the past month before explantation actually saw a significant increase in uh, E. coli, Pseudomonas, Staphylococcus, and urea plasma, all of which are known neuropathogens. And we repeated the same uh, study design uh, in multiple urologic devices like uh, neuromodulators, um, artificial urinary sphincter, sphincters, and uh, inflatable penile prosthetics. And in every case, we get the same, uh, the same relationship, even though they're independent cohorts. 
Most of the time, we also saw a significant decrease in lactobacillus and lactococcus, um, but we didn't see that decrease in, in this specific um, cohort. And so what this data really shows us is that the antibiotics had the opposite of the intended effect. It increased rather than decreased the pathogens that were present uh, and oftentimes decreased the uroprotective bacteria. We also replicated this finding in a mouse model and so what we did is we took just normal Swiss Webster mice and the only intervention we gave them was some animals received um, antibiotics and specifically um, Savazolin, which goes through the urinary tract system unchanged. And so what we found through molecular imaging and culture-based analyses was that the Savazolin treated animals had significantly lower levels of Altaxa as well as the uroprotective lactobacillus, but the Enterobacteraceae and specific E. coli remained unchanged. And so this suggests that antibiotics had a broad effect on um, the bacteria or the kidney microbiome, but didn't touch uh, the uropathogenic bacteria. So we have a lot of uh, image and molecular data um, showing the kidney bacteria. And so what we wanted to do is take this one step further and uh, gather some culture-based confirmation that there are bacteria uh, in the kidneys. And so we've had a lot of difficulty doing this in humans so far, and we're still hoping to do that, but um, in mice, it's a lot easier. Um, and so what we did is we took uh, biopsies from different regions of the kidneys and we plated them against multiple different uh, media types and then incubated them. And we did two different analyses. One, we just did an uh, unweighted analysis and say, did bacteria grow on the plate or not? And so what we saw from that unweighted analysis is that not only that kidney or bacteria are often present, but that there's a, a significant uh, differentiation in the distribution of those bacteria. So whether we looked at the cortex versus the medulla or the ureter. We also calculated the total uh, viable bacterial load and we saw the same uh, relationship. And so this really supports the hypothesis that the kidneys are, are filtering out um, bacteria from systemic circulation. And specifically in the sort of the beginning stages of, of filtration, we see the least amount of bacteria. And as you concentrate you know, the filtrate into the medulla, and eventually into the ureter where, where all of the, the waste kind of comes out, we see that significant increase um, in concentration of bacteria. So um, then what we wanted to do is see if um, these kidney bacteria are actually physiologically relevant for a specific um, urologic disease, in this case, um, kidney stones. And so we have this um, bioreactor model from the CDC, and this has been used previously by Dirk Lang and, and a few other groups um, to look at mechanisms of struvite stone uh, formation, but we wanted to repurpose this for calcium oxalate. And so this is kind of a graphical model of, of what the bioreactor looks like. And so we have a reservoir here in which we included um, sterile artificial urine media that was enriched in um, calcium and oxalate. And then this is linked to a, a chemostat, which then has effluent that goes into a waste container. And so if we look at a picture of the actual chemostat, you see at the bottom, um, there's the stir bar, which uh, we can set to um, produce shear forces that are similar to what is seen in urine flowing through the kidneys. And we also have um, the ability to put in these removable coupons in these circular spaces here, so that what we can do after the study is done is we can remove those coupons and do our, our you know, microbiome analyses on them. And so in our past, um, kidney stone studies, both from our group and from others, we've really honed in on lactobacillus crispatus as protective against stones and a specific strain of E. coli um, that promotes stones. And we, we, we've shown that because this strain of E. coli is the most abundant um, across multiple non-infection stone types. And so we brought these two specific strains into our bioreactor model to see how they influence um, calcium oxalate. And so here we have um, E. coli in a monoculture um, you can see in the kind of like where the red arrow is, the, the typical dihydrate octahedral structure of calcium oxalate. And the red arrow is actually pointing towards a, a, an E. coli bacterium attached to the calcium oxalate. And in the white box here, we see this large kind of ugly structure, which is basically aggregated calcium oxalate um, octahedral structures. Um, and in this green arrow here, I, I'm showing sort of nanos, nanospheres of calcium oxalate um, which really shows a, a non-caniacal um, calcium oxalate uh, crystal growth, um, which I won't really go, go into today. Um, if you look at the monoculture of lactobacillus crispatus, we see something opposite. And so specifically the calcium oxalate crystals that form 
are much smaller, they're more amorphous, and the lactobacillus themselves are never attached to them. When we combine these two strains, what's interesting is that the, the calcium oxalate crystals that form shift from a, a uh, octahedral structure to more of a calcium oxalate monohydrate needle-like structure with more of a biofilm uh, phenotype. If we quantify the size of the overall calcium oxalate um, crystals relative to a sterile control, we see that the E. coli increased while the lactobacillus crispatus decreased um, overall calcium oxalate crystal size. And this was coupled with oxalate production by E. coli and oxalate degradation by lactobacillus crispatus. And this um, shows us clearly that these you know, strains that are associated positively or negatively with um, urinary stone disease um, clearly and directly influence um, calcium oxalate uh, crystal growth and aggregation. Um, so what we can conclude uh, from these data is that through image-based and transcriptomic data uh, in human samples, we find a clear uh, evidence of bacteria in the kidneys that's associated with kidney function and kidney disease. And we show that antibiotics increase um, the abundance of uropathogens while decreasing uroprotective bacteria. In mice, we've used uh, image, molecular, and culture-based evidence uh, um, to show basically the same, uh, the same thing. In our in vitro model, we show direct uh, evidence that you, um, urinary stone disease-associated bacteria, both positive and negative, um, directly influence calcium oxalate growth and aggregation. Um, so I would be happy to take questions at the end, um, but so, thank you. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about understanding the role of host cell metabolism in urinary tract infection. And before I really get down to all the urinary tract infection stuff and why I'm interested in it, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my background and how I got there. So I'm a surgeon scientist. So I'm a urogynecologist. I did my PhD in molecular and cellular biology and a postdoc in physiology and biophysics before going to medical school. And so the conditions I usually treat are things like pelvic organ prolapse, urinary and fecal incontinence, and things like recurrent urinary tract infection. And so I started some of my fellowship research um, to try to figure out things that are going on with these conditions. And these conditions, although they're not life-threatening, impact about 60% of women, based on which, depending on which numbers you look at. And even though they don't kill people, they severely impact the lives of women. So there was a lovely paper in JAMA in 2016 showing that more women thought bowel and bladder incontinence were worse than death than things like relying on a breathing machine and being confused all the time. So even though, you know, people will tell you it's just a UTI or it's just prolapse or it's just these other things, these are horrible conditions for patients. And the muscles that help segregate us from these worse than death disorders are the pelvic floor muscles. So I really began my research in urogynecology studying pelvic floor muscles and how, how they help us and how they're regulated and modified. And one of the most traumatic things these poor little muscles can endure is vaginal delivery where they're stretched to over 300% of, the, of their normal physiologic limits. And I started kind of thinking about the question of why aren't all women impacted by this? And I joined the lab of Mariana Alperin at UC San Diego, and she had kind of, she had identified that pelvic floor muscles get longer during pregnancy. Um, she studies it in rat. These muscles are analog analogous to the muscles that are found in human. And so these muscles elongate during pregnancy by increasing the number of sarcomeres in series. And so this happens specifically in muscles of the pelvic floor, but does not happen in muscles such as tibialis, tibialis anterior, which is a muscle of the limb. And one of the things that I did when I joined the lab is I started thinking about, okay, fine. So these muscles get longer. What kind of proteins are actually changed in these muscles as a consequence of pregnancy? And in the urogynecology world, there's a lot of emphasis on extracellular matrix and the proteins involved in support and some of the animal models that exist for things like prolapse are problems with collagen disorders. And really what we found was actually quite different than what we expected. We really found that there were a lot of proteins involved in metabolism that changed during pregnancy that allowed these muscles to undergo these adaptations, proteins involved in mitochondrial function and oxidative capacity. And so that really sort of opened my eyes to the world of metabolism and the world and the role that metabolism could play in cell and tissue function in a whole different way. And I 
you know, so now have a K project looking at mitochondrial metabolism and how it impacts regeneration of pelvic floor muscles after birth injury. But one of the things that I noticed in my animals with impaired metabolism in the setting of diet induced obesity is their urinary patterns were also a little bit different too. So there's more things than just the pelvic floor muscles that are important. And obese women are actually predisposed to multiple pelvic floor disorders, not just things like prolapse, there is urinary incontinence, but also things like recurrent UTI. Um, so I'll kind of get over to the UTI part finally, because wasn't this talk supposed to be about UTIs? <laughs> uh, and really think about broader pictures. I'm very junior, just started by a faculty's position about a year ago. The big picture theme for the research that I'm undertaking is how does meta metabolism impact pelvic floor disorders, including things like recurrent UTI. And you guys know that UTI is a big problem, that over 50% of women will experience UTI during their lifetime and incredibly costly with about $2 billion annually in the US. And the recurrence rates are high, about 70 80 to 80% will have breakthrough infections even with active suppression. And as Dr. Miller alluded to, the definition of a UTI and culture standards are completely outdated and fail to reflect basically the presence of the urinary microbiome at all. There's some ICS definitions using standard urine cultures and symptoms, but really overall, it, we don't have great ways of deciding what bacteria in bladders needs to be treated. And it doesn't include any insight into the pathophysiology of UTI recurrence. So there's been some studies in clinical literature um, in human populations, kind of looking at what happens with expectant management of UTI. So if you expectantly manage with placebo or you give placebo versus antibiotics, there's spontaneous cure and resolution of symptoms and bacteriuria, albeit measured by these you know, standard culture methods in 24% of patients. So, which is pretty phenomenal given that usually nowadays as clinicians, we conventionally treat with antibiotics right off the bat. So since this resolution occurs in this large percentage of participants, what differentiates people that clear UTIs from people that have UTIs that need to be treated with antibiotics? And even one step further, women with UTIs that then come back. And in mice, there's also some issues with UTI persistence. So even in mouse models of urinary tract infection, many result in resolution. And then there's some that some mice that go on to have chronic cystitis and persistent bacteriuria and chronic inflammation. And so I did some work just kind of correlating UTI symptoms with microbes to better understand kind of what was going on in that regard. But there's still a lot to be, you know, is this bacterial based or is this host based? And so what we found was that patient symptoms were correlated with bacteria in the setting of recurrent UTI, but not in the setting of sporadic UTI, suggesting that there's potentially a host factor rather than a bacterial factor that contributes to things like symptoms and clearance. There's also a lot of literature from other groups showing um, different prevalence of different bacteria and urinary microbes in the setting of recurrent UTI versus controls and in the presence and absence of antibiotics. And I'm sure many of us are familiar, and probably you guys know this even better than I do, sort of the paradigm of what happens with UTI. So that the urothelium is multi-layered, the infection presumably occurs at the superficial umbrella cells, and then in the best case scenario or the clearance of a urinary tract infection, the, the superficial group of cells is shed and exfoliated to remove the bacteria from any of the, any layers. But in some cases, these bacteria become intracellular and persistent. And so that's kind of sets up this difference in what happens potentially with resolution versus chronic cystitis. There's rapid elimination of infection and mucosal healing in the setting of clearance and mucosal wounding that promotes this recurrence and the maintenance of intracellular bacterial um, colonies with recurrence. And so there was a lovely paper, um, I don't think Maria's on today, but she was on Wednesday uh, from Vanderbilt showing that part of the mechanism for UPEC at least, although the CYPBD gene is shared between many uropathogens, is that this gene from UPEC alters mitochondrial metabolism of host urothelial cells, stabilizes things like HIF-1, and promotes uh, cell survival and intracellular bacterial persistence. And so this starts to bring into question, what role does host mitochondrial function have in this process? 
And it, because it sort of sets up the stage of alterations in bacterial and host metabolism can impact this immune function in urothelial remodeling. And so when I read that paper, I really thought about our clinical populations. Is Does coming into a UTI with altered mitochondrial function change your susceptibility and your risk of recurrence for UTI? And so one of the things that we kind of think about for UTI treatment and prevention currently are things like antibiotics, D-mannose, and vaginal estrogen cream. And antibiotics, the whole goal is to kill bacteria, but as Dr. Miller pointed out, these don't always kill the bacteria that you want them to kill. They might kill other bacteria and have other adverse effects, and then bacteria become resistant, and then patients have symptoms regardless. d is more targeted specifically to E. coli and has its own limitations and efficacy. And then vaginal estrogen cream, although we know it works, the mechanism is a little bit unclear. We know that lactobacillus growth is promoted, but the mechanism by which is kind of unknown. So there was a large study with, uh, this was out of Kaiser, of over 5,600 postmenopausal women looking at vaginal estrogen use and the setting of recurrent UTI. So these women had on average 3.9 infections per year before vaginal, uh, vaginal estrogen use. This was reduced to 1.8 infections per year after initiation of vaginal estrogen, so like a 52% reduction. And so there were women that were that didn't have this improvement with vaginal estrogen. It was women that were aged 75 and greater, increased frequency of UTIs at baseline, and women with diabetes. So I just wanted to point out that two of these conditions are things that we commonly think of as impaired metabolic states and are known in other literature to be associated with impaired mitochondrial function, so aging and diabetes. And so that led me to think about how does host metabolism impact UTI pathogenicity and can urinary metabolomics give insight into the dynamic interplay between host and bacteria? So I've started doing some urinary metabolomics work with Peter Dorstein. I'm currently writing some of that stuff up now just for benchmarking to be able to utilize clinical specimens in the um, that have been stored for other studies. Um, and then also starting to think about what kind of mouse experiments would I want to do to test this hypothesis? And can regulation of metabolism reduce bacterial persistence in UTI patients? Are there ways to improve metabolism as a way of improving bacterial clearance? Um, and so one of the things that I want to do in a mouse model is use an OVEX mouse model, look at mitochondrial function in the bladder, just like I've been looking at mitochondrial function in pelvic floor muscles for my other study, <laughs> and see what happens with mitochondrial function in the bladder, and does mitochondrial function correlate with the ability to clear bacteria. And so if you love mitochondria, urinary uh, and muscle metabolomics, patients with pelvic floor disorders, uh, UTIs or want some clinical perspective on some of these conditions, although I will say I'm not a urologist, I'm a urogynecologist, or happen to be in San Diego and want to go sailing. These are sorts of my areas of interest and the research trajectories that um, I'm shooting for. So less data than Dr. Miller's talk, but definitely trying to give the 10,000 foot view of metabolism and pelvic floor disorders.